Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> we'll start as usual with prayers to get ourselves into a good state of mind. And then I thought to lead a meditation this morning. Um, <clears throat> back in the 80s, um, when I wrote my first book, How to Meditate, with a lot of help from Venerable Rabina, um, I composed a meditation that I call Body of Light Meditation. It's in that book. And what I wanted to do was, because by that time I had received quite a few tantric initiations, done retreats, and found the practice really helpful of <coughs> visualizing a deity outside of you, doing various prayers and meditations, mantras, and then um, imagining the deity melting into light, dissolving into you and um, act activating, I guess you could say, activating your Buddha nature, helping you get in touch with your Buddha nature. Um, and But I was also aware that many Western people are not so comfortable with deities um in fact some people <laughs> um you know just feel very very um uncomfortable about visualizing deities other people just have a lot of difficulty visualizing um <clears throat> so i wanted to take the essence of that kind of practice and make it available for, even for people who have difficulties with with deities and so, um, so I created this meditation where instead of visualizing a deity, you just visualize a sphere of light. And then um, imagine that that represents all the positive qualities, compassion, love, wisdom, purity, and so on and so forth. And, um, and then bringing that into yourself and imagining your mind being blessed by that and your positive potential activated. So I thought to lead that meditation for you <laughs> to start with, because it is, um, yeah, it is a way of getting a sort of taste of, of, of the essential practice of Tantra without all the details of, you know, visualizing deities and, and, um, <clears throat> and also because without <laughs> receiving an initiation, it's not possible to, um, visualize yourself as a deity. Um, you can still visualize deities outside and have them come into you, but not to then appear yourself in the form of a deity. So this kind of practice, again, is a sort of step towards that. It can be done by anybody, even if they're not Buddhist, they haven't taken refuge and so on. Okay, so we'll do the prayers and then spend a few minutes relaxing and generating a positive motivation and then going into that meditation. <clears throat> So while reciting the prayers, if you want, if you feel comfortable doing so, you can imagine the Buddha in front of you <clears throat> and think that this image of the Buddha made of light, radiant, pure, emanating all these amazing enlightened qualities, that, that image um, is inseparable from your spiritual teachers and from all the other objects of refuge, all the Buddhas and other holy beings, bodhisattvas, and so on. <coughs> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened 
to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. <clears throat> This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. So then, if you visualize the Buddha in front of you, imagine light flowing from the Buddha into you, and it purifies all negative energy, like negative karma that we have created with body, speech, and mind, and um, diluted states of mind, like the three poisons, greed, hatred, ignorance. So all negative energy of body and mind being purified. You can imagine it going out of your body and sinking into the earth below, disappearing there, leaving your body clean and clear like crystal. And imagine the light also nourishes your positive potential. So we all have good qualities in our mind. We all have love and compassion and basic wisdom and certain amount of mindfulness and concentration. And these can be developed even further and eventually become enlightened qualities. So imagine that the light from the Buddha nourishes those qualities so that they can grow and increase become more perfect and pure and eventually um, enlightened those qualities at the state of enlightenment. So imagine that happening while we recite the mantra of the Buddha three times. <clears throat> Make sure you're sitting comfortably. Try to keep your back straight. That helps to keep the mind more clear, focused, alert when meditating. 
but try not to be tense. Try not to have tension in your back or shoulders or anywhere in your body. Try to be as relaxed as possible. And take a few minutes to settle your mind in the present. Paying attention to the breathing going in and out is a good way of doing that because our breath is happening in the present. So when we're observing our breathing, our mind is naturally in the present moment and present place. But while doing that, thoughts may pop up in your mind about other places and other times, past, future. And if you if that happens, don't be surprised or upset. It's normal. But just be firm and not let your mind follow those thoughts, get caught up in those thoughts. Instead, put them aside and come back to the breathing. So just really try your best to stay right here in the present place and present moment. Being aware of each breath coming in, going out, one breath after another. So being aware of the present moment like this is a neutral state of mind, not not virtuous or non-virtuous. And when we do some Dharma activity, like listening to teachings or doing other meditations or practices, it's best to have a positive, virtuous motivation for what we're doing. So let's take a few more minutes to generate such a motivation. If you're comfortable with bodhicitta, the aspiration to become a fully enlightened Buddha in order to benefit all living beings. So if that feels right to you, you're comfortable thinking in that way, you can bring that into your mind as your motivation for being here. If you're relatively new, haven't studied that much, not yet sure about enlightenment and your ability to attain enlightenment or whatever, then you don't need to generate full bodhicitta, but try to have at least an aspiration to benefit others. This is called altruism, meaning caring about others, wanting to help them as much as possible, not harm them. So that may be something you're comfortable with. So in your own words, your own thoughts, generate such a motivation. For example, you could think, I'm here to learn more about 
Buddhist teachings and practices so that I can become a better person, more able to help others, less likely to harm others. So that's just a suggestion, but use your own thoughts and words, whatever works best for you to generate such a motivation. Okay, so now <clears throat> visualize or imagine in the space above your head a sphere of light. It's not sitting right on top of your head, but a few inches above the top of your head. And it's not something solid, but just pure light, a bit like a rainbow. When we see a rainbow in the sky, it's not something solid that could be touched or grabbed or held onto, but it can appear very solid, but it's just like light, transparent and radiant. So imagine a sphere of light above your head like that. It's just pure, transparent, intangible, radiant light, and you can make it whatever color you wish. But think that it represents all the positive qualities, all the positive energy that exists in the universe. So if you're familiar with enlightenment, you know something about the qualities of an enlightened being, like the Buddha, infinite love, compassion, non-judgmentalness, forgiveness, patience, and so on, and wisdom, understanding the true nature of things. So all those positive qualities developed to the fullest extent and other qualities you can think of and feel inspired to develop in yourself. So think that this sphere of light above your head represents those qualities. It is those qualities in the form of this ball of light. So just take a few minutes to visualize that, imagine that, and get a sense the, that what this sphere of light represents. <clears throat> Now, feel the wish to bring this 
light into yourself and merge with it and have those qualities within yourself as part of you, part of your mind, part of your experience. <clears throat> And then imagine the light melting, dissolving, becoming like liquid light, which flows down into the top of your head and comes to your heart chakra in the center of your chest. And there it merges with your mind. In Buddhism, it's said that the center or the seat of our mind, our consciousness is not in the brain, but in our heart chakra, in the center of our chest. So feel that your mind merges with all those positive qualities that the light represented. Feel that those qualities become your qualities. Love, compassion, forgiveness, wisdom, and so on. And any opposing qualities there may be in your mind, like anger, hatred, selfishness, greed, uh, other delusions, misconceptions, and so on. So imagine those dissolve and disappear. They are not permanent. They are not going to be with us forever and ever. We can eliminate them. So imagine them going away, vanishing, disappearing, such that your mind just becomes totally one with all those positive qualities. Imagine the light flowing into every part of your body, purifying your body, releasing any negative energy in your body. And imagine your body becoming a body of light. Clear, pure, like a piece of crystal. So for a few minutes, just remain in that experience of your body being completely pure, clear like crystal, and your mind being totally transformed, free of all negative, disturbing, mistaken thoughts and emotions, and experiencing only positive, beneficial thoughts and emotions. Feel that this is your real nature, who you really are, your real identity.
feel how nice it would be to share this experience with others, with all sentient beings, because they all have the same potential we do. They all have within their mind positive qualities, although they're not yet fully developed. And they all have the potential to be free of all negative qualities. So now imagine rays of light radiating out from you, from your body. It's like rays of light going out from the sun in all directions. And in a completely unbiased way. The sun has no bias. It doesn't say, I'm going to shine on this person, but not on that person. I'm going to shine on this country, but not on that country. So the sun sends its light everywhere, to everyone, every being, every place, free of bias. So in the same way, imagine the light going out from you to all directions, to all living beings everywhere, without any discrimination or bias. And imagine it penetrates into the bodies and minds of every living being, reaches their heart, seat of their mind, their consciousness, and transforms them, frees them from all suffering, causes of suffering, disturbing thoughts and emotions, delusions. All those dissolve, disappear, become non-existent. And all their positive qualities are nourished and developed so that they become fully developed and perfected. So their bodies and minds become completely pure and clear just like ours. Now, before you open your eyes and come out of the meditation, just mentally dedicate the positive energy or merit of doing this practice that one day we'll be able to do it in actuality. We will be able to perfect ourselves, bring ourselves to the state of enlightenment and help all other living beings reach that state as well. Okay, so when you're ready, you can open your eyes, change your position if you need to. <clears throat> like I say, this meditation is a way of getting in touch with the essence of Tantra. Tantra can be quite complicated. The visualizations are very complicated and elaborate sometimes. But this is kind of the essence of it, is getting in touch with our Buddha nature, our potential for enlightenment, and nourishing it so that it can be manifest and developed and eventually 
we are an enlightened being and then helping all other beings get in touch with their potential for enlightenment and actualizing that as well. And um, I don't know if any of you have read the book by Lama Yeshi called Introduction to Tantra. Um, he talks in there a lot about how we sometimes have a very low opinion of ourselves. It's been a long time since I read the book, so I don't remember the exact words, but um, this is something he could really see in his Western disciples. He was quite extraordinary. He, he could see us and recognize our hangups and our problems often before we could see them ourselves. <laughs> so he often talked about that. I think he could see that and also you know, when students would come to him and talk about their problems, he recognized this, that we have this tendency to um, put ourselves down and um, see ourselves as very low and incapable of changing and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, it is a common problem. Maybe not everybody has it, but many people do. Kind of low self-esteem, even self-hatred, self-denigration, and, and so on. And so he addresses that kind of issue in, in the book and talks about how, you know, Tantra works against that, opposes that to help us get in touch with our potential, our positive qualities, and accepting that we can develop those qualities. It can't happen overnight. But slowly and gradually, if we nourish those positive qualities and work on decreasing the negative qualities, we can become a different person and eventually become an enlightened being, just like the Buddha, Tara, Chenrezig, and all these other deities. So that's really what um, Tantra is all about. So I don't know if during that meditation you came up against any resistance, like oh, this is impossible, this is just a fantasy, it's not true, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I know I've had that kind of problem, and I still do, it still comes up. So it's mainly because of habit. Um, and, um, you know, having thought that way, having had that kind of thought for a long time, maybe thousands of times or millions of times. So it, it just becomes a habit. Um, and what we're doing with Tantra and also with Buddhism in general, meditation practice in general, is we're trying to develop different patterns of thinking, different habits. Like, oh, I, can, I do have Buddha nature. I can transform myself. My delusions are not permanent. They're, you know, they're impermanent. They can change. And, and then working on cultivating the positive qualities, loving kindness, compassion. And that's really what meditation is all about. The word for meditation in Tibetan is gom, which um, has the sense of being familiar or being habituated. So what we're doing when we meditate is making ourselves familiar with or making ourselves habituated to um, more positive, more constructive ways of thinking and attitudes and, and states of mind. And the more we do that, the more they become habitual. They become familiar. They become the things that arise naturally and spontaneously as opposed to anger and attachment and selfishness and so on and so forth. And so that's why they say we need to meditate again and again and again. Meditating on loving kindness once isn't going to totally transform your mind and suddenly you become a totally loving person towards everybody. You know, you have to do it again and again and again and again. And slowly, gradually, loving kindness becomes your natural way of being, your default mode, your way of relating to others. And anger doesn't just completely go away like that, but slowly, slowly, we work on decreasing it, overcoming it, and that it kind of gets smaller and weaker. So it's almost like a scale, you know, those kind of scales. They might still use them in some parts of the world, but you got these two pans, you know, and you put, okay, one pound weight over here, and then you put your other stuff over here. And anyway, so it's like that, you know, we are trying to um, increase the positive thoughts so that they become heavier and decrease the negative thoughts so they become lighter. 
And um, slowly, gradually, over time, it does happen. And I can say that with confidence. I've really seen in myself. There's still delusions. <laughs> and my positive qualities aren't as developed as I would like to. But I can definitely see before and after, you know, comparing yourself. And I'm sure you can do this as well. Before you met the Dharma, before you started meditating, working on these things, the way you were back then than the way you are now. If you're honest, you should be able to see some improvement, some change. Mm -hmm. And so then that shows that it does work. And if you keep going, keep practicing like this, then you will change even more. And sometimes <laughs> I hear from people, um, they say that, I don't think I've changed at all. But my sister <laughs> tells me, or you know, my wife tells me, or somebody else says, you've really changed. <laughs> and so that's another way we can see that we've changed. Sometimes we have high expectations, you know, we want to change totally, really fast. And so if we haven't reached that point, then we may think, oh, I haven't changed at all. I'm still the same person I always was. But if other people give us feedback and say, you have changed, you're a lot nicer, <laughs> you're not easier to live with than you used to be. So it's good to listen to that and believe that. Yeah. And try not to have over, over, ex, um, overly high expectations of yourself, but be honest, try to be really honest with yourself. And I'm sure you can accept, acknowledge that there has been positive changes, positive improvement, improvements. Okay, so we're looking at Tantra. So yesterday um, we looked at the foundations of Tantra, the basic practices we need to cultivate, train ourselves in, in order to practice Tantra. And then we looked at some of the um, differences between uh, Tantra which is one branch of Mahayana, and Sutra, Sutrayana, Sutra vehicle, which is another branch of Mahayana. What are the uh, things they have in common and what are the unique features of Tantra Vajrayana? So I'll pick up from there and add some more material today. Um, the first slide I have for today um, is different names for Tantra. So Tantra is called by different names. And I don't know how important this is, but if you're reading books and listening to teachings, you might encounter these different terms. So just to know that um, they're all just different names for the same thing. But the different names have different um, meanings or different reasons why that particular term is used. So Tantra um, the, the term Tantra itself, um, I found something on um, Alex Berzin's website. Have you heard of Alex Berzin? He's one of the first um, Western people to start studying Tibetan Buddhism. And he's quite a scholar. He knows Tibetan and Sanskrit. I think he has a PhD from Harvard in you know, Asian studies. And he's written a lot of books, translated a lot. And he has this really good website called Study Buddhism. It used to be called Burrs and Archives, but now it's called Study Buddhism. So if you're wondering about something, go to Study Buddhism and type it in, and <laughs> you'll probably find lots of information. It's a really good resource and a reliable one. Um, I don't know about all the other <laughs> websites that have information about Buddhism. They may not all be reliable, but this one definitely is. And so... Um, on his website, I came across an explanation of this term Tantra. It's a Sanskrit word, and it means something stretched out. <laughs> and stretched out in two senses of the word. One is stretched out like the warp of threads on a loom. Um, so you, I, I guess people still use looms to weave things. So you've got threads going this way and threads going that way, and they're stretched in a frame. Um, so he says, Tantra practice is the warp on which to weave all the sutra practices together. That's quite cool. So again, 
ideally, we're very familiar with the practices of sutra, like the three principal aspects of the path, and especially bodhicitta, and the six perfections, the understanding of this, and so on. So we should be very familiar with those. And Tantra is weaving all of those together. That's one meaning. And then stretched out is also in the sense of an everlasting continuum through time, stretching through time with no beginning and no end. This refers in general to our mental continuum, the continuum of our individual subjective experience of life. This continuum includes having a body, speech, uh, mind, activity, and various good qualities like understanding and care, both for self and others. We all have these aspects in some form and to some level of development in each lifetime. So again, Buddhism says our mind has no beginning. It didn't start at a certain point in time. It wasn't created by anybody like a divine creator. It's always been existing. And I know this is really hard. <laughs> it's one of those questions that we just have to put up in the shelf and not think we can figure it out. <laughs> but yeah. But see, on the other hand, you know, if you try to say there is a beginning, a beginning to, some, to things, well, there had to be something before that to be able to cause that beginning, you know? Like what came before the mind? What created the mind? And then what created that? And what created that? And what created that? And so on. So even in, say, Christianity, what I was brought up in, you know, we say God was always there. God was always existing. And then at some point he decided to create the world and us and everything. But where did God come from? They would say, oh, he's always been there. Nobody <laughs> created God. <laughs> He always existed. So again, you have the same kind of thing, beginninglessness. <laughs> so um, trying to figure out a beginning is, is just too much for us, <laughs> for our little minds. And so, yeah, beginningless. So our mind has no beginning. It's always been existing, but it also has no end. It will always exist. So even after becoming enlightened, becoming a Buddha, that's like the highest possible state of mind there is, it will continue. And the Buddha, as a Buddha, one will continue working to help sentient beings, leading them out of suffering, leading them to enlightenment. So there's plenty to do, you no know, time to get bored. <laughs> Some people think it sounds boring to exist forever. But um, no, but Buddha doesn't get bored. Okay, so anyway, that's another meaning of Tantra. It's this everlasting continuum of our mind with all its positive qualities, Buddha nature. So that's yeah, two meanings of Tantra. So then Tantra, yeah, is, is also called Tantrayana, the word yana, meaning vehicle, which mainly refers to states of mind, realizations that we develop and progress along up to enlightenment. And then the second term is resultant vehicle. I talked a little bit about that yesterday um, because tantric practice involves imagining we are already a Buddha, which is the result we're aiming for. That's what we are trying to achieve is Buddhahood enlightenment with all these amazing qualities and abilities. So we're bringing that resultant state into the present and imagining it's already here. It's already happening now. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but yeah, so that's why it's called the resultant vehicle because you're taking the result into the path, into the present. Whereas sutra, the sutra um, vehicle, sutrayana, doesn't do that, doesn't have that kind of practice. So it's called a causal vehicle because you focus on creating the causes for enlightenment. Okay, right now I'm creating um, virtue and practicing the six perfections with the bodhicitta motivation. So I'm creating the causes for enlightenment. But they don't have a practice of bringing the result into the path, into the present. 
The third name is secret vehicle or secret mantra. So it's often called secret mantra. And this term secret um, might make you feel a little suspicious, you know, like when somebody has a secret, it's like, oh, what are they trying to hide? <laughs> it's not like that. <clears throat> but because some of the practices of Tantra can be easily misunderstood and misused as you know we have examples of this in the world now but it's I think it's always been the case there's always been people who take tantric practices and then misuse them and even abuse others with you know in the name of tantra so it was meant to be kept secret and only taught to those who were qualified a teacher would um, I mean, in the past, what would happen is, I think, um, like in India and, and Tibet in the past, um, a student would go and live with their teacher, and they so they would have quite a lot of, you know, interaction, and the teacher would be able to see what the student was like, what kind of qualities they had, and so on. It would be teaching them and guiding them, and then the teacher would see at a certain point that student was ready to receive an initiation and would give them an initiation. So that's how it happened in the past. But I think in Tibet and certainly now in the present, it's become very different. Initiations are often given publicly and anybody can go almost. I mean, in Dharamsala, you're supposed to sign up and kind of promise that you are qualified and you're going to do the practices and so on. But in many places, anybody can walk into an initiation and take it. So there's no chance for the teacher to really check the disciples and know if they're ready or not. So it's really become quite different. But originally it was more secret in the sense of just teaching it to a small number of disciples who were ready and suitable for it. But also, another reason for the term secret is it, when we do take initiations and practice Tantra, we're supposed to do it in a discreet way, <clears throat> not talk openly about it and um, show, um, you know, pictures and tankas of deities and vajras and bells, the implements and so on. We're supposed to keep those hidden. <clears throat> Um, the reason for that is that we might lose any energy, any realizations that we may have gained. They say it's like if you have jewelry in your house, <laughs> right? it's probably better not to put it on a display. You just leave it lying around because you don't know people coming into your house. Those things could disappear. So it's better to sort of keep them hidden from you. <laughs> Um, so in a similar way, if we talk too openly or display too openly um, our practice of Tantra, then it's possible for um, our realizations to be lost. <clears throat> and also then again, there's that danger of pride and arrogance and feeling superior and boastful and, and that should be avoided. <coughs> Okay, then the, the fourth is called mantrayana. So that's another term, the mantra vehicle. And the word mantra, you're probably familiar with. It's probably even in the dictionary. <laughs> um, it's a Sanskrit word, and it means protection for the mind. Man is mind, and then tra is protection. So a mantra, that's the purpose of a mantra, is, pr is protecting our mind. Mantras... Most of them, if not all of them, are in Sanskrit. And like I was saying yesterday, they weren't translated into Tibetan. They left them in Sanskrit because Sanskrit is considered to be a sacred language, a holy language, not an ordinary language. And so it said that just reciting the syllables of a, of a mantra and the origin of a mantra it's, it's not like an advertising jingo that, you know, people come up with, <laughs> but it's from enlightened mind, the Buddha's mind, enlightened mind manifests in the form of these syllables of a mantra. And so by reciting a mantra, we're connecting with enlightened mind and it itself 
has an effect on our body, our nervous system, and helps protect our mind from negative thoughts, negative attitudes, delusions, and helps to increase our positive um, qualities and realizations. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so I think in all tantric practices, there, there's always at least one mantra, often many mantras that one learns and practices and recites. And then the fifth term on the list is Vajrayana. So the term Vajra, um, the, it's the name of this kind of implement you've probably seen. I don't know if there's any here, but... Um, People who do tantric practice usually get one of these and you hold it in your hand while you're doing tantric practices. And the Vajra, the origin of the Vajra is said to be one of the Hindu gods named Indra, who was, um, he's like considered the lord of the gods in a particular um, god realm. And the Vajra, he would hold the Vajra as a scepter, as a symbol of his power. And the Indra's Vajra was such that, I don't know, it was made of some material that was totally indestructible. And that's why some people translate Vajra as diamond. It's not really correct. It's not really a diamond. But because a diamond apparently is a very hard material that, that can, you know, harm other things or cut other things, but it itself is very hard to cut. So that kind of quality of being really hard and indestructible. Um, so that's the sense, the meaning of Vajra. Vajra means something like indestructible and also inseparable. And so it refers to, I mentioned this yesterday, one of the unique features of Tantra is the ability to practice method and wisdom together in one mind, one consciousness, which is very special. Because to reach enlightenment, we do need to cultivate both method and wisdom. Those are like the two wings of a bird. And in sutra, the sutra practice, sutrayana, one practices method and wisdom separately at different times with different minds, but they do affect each other. They do influence each other. But in tantra, there's these practices for uh, having method and wisdom in one mind, one single mind, which makes it much more powerful and more quick, more fast to um, overcome obscurations and reach your goal of enlightenment. Um, so there's a lot of symbolism about that union, that inseparable union of method and wisdom as a unique feature of Tantra. Okay, so anyway, just so you know, those are different terms or Tantra. So let's see. I don't know. Maybe we should have a break now. I usually have a break at 11 um, because the next thing is a little complex. So maybe before getting into that, <laughs> um, let's just have a five minute break. <clears throat> okay, so the next um, slide has information about what are called the four complete purities. So these are part of deity yoga. The practice uh, just briefly introduced yesterday where you do, after receiving an initiation, you usually have a commitment to do a daily practice related to that deity. And that involves visualization, meditation, and so on, and meditating on emptiness and then arising out of emptiness in the form of the deity. And, um, and even after you've finished your practice, when you're going about your daily activities, you continue uh, imagining yourself in this form of the deity. <clears throat> and um, so these four complete purities are four different aspects of that practice. And the reason or the purpose for doing this kind of practice is to overcome 
ordinary view and ordinary grasping. So it's said that in, in Tantra, those are the two main obstacles we need to overcome to actualize our Buddha nature and become enlightened. So ordinary view means just seeing yourself in an ordinary way. I'm ordinary Joe Blow <laughs> or whoever you are, you know. This is who I am. And, you know, we have the tendency to feel this is our real nature and we're going to be like this forever. But it's ordinary as opposed to enlightenment. Um, still with our ordinary delusions, our afflictions, our problems, our suffering, our confusion, our karma. So we tend to feel this is who I am. And there's this kind of, it, it's a fixed view, you know. It's like it's, this is real. This is who I am and I'll always be this way. So that's the meaning of ordinary view. And then ordinary grasping is, well, ordinary view is just seeing oneself as ordinary. And then ordinary grasping is like believing in that. Uh, grasping at that, believing in that, that's who I am and I can't change, I, I'll, I'll always be this way. So those attitudes are there in our mind and um, probably most people aren't even aware of it. <laughs> um, they think this is reality, this is who I am, how I am and you know, I know who I am. Um, so anyway, that those two things, ordinary view and ordinary grasping are considered the main obstacles in, that need to be overcome to reach enlightenment. And so this practice of seeing yourself as a deity counteracts that, opposes that, is an antidote to that. And um, also this practice of deity yoga with these four purities is the cause for the rupakaya, the form body of the Buddha that I explained yesterday. So one aspect of enlightenment there's two main aspects, dharmakaya, rupakaya. So dharmakaya is the Buddha's mind, totally pure, totally developed, omniscient. And then the rupakaya are the form bodies of the Buddha. The Buddha has the ability to manifest in any form at all that will be beneficial for sentient beings. That's the whole purpose is to help sentient beings. So they manifest in these different forms. So that's the rupakaya. So these, this practice of deity yoga and the four purities is creating the cause for the rupakaya when we're enlightened. So the first is the complete purity of environment. So what that means is um, you, you're visualizing yourself as a deity and you're also visualizing the environment around you and wherever you go. You visualize that as the mandala of the deity. So um, mandala is another aspect of, of tantra. Um, each deity, when you, when you visualize a deity either outside of yourself or as yourself, is in the center of a mandala. And the word mandala, I don't know exactly what it means, but you've probably seen mandalas. Do the... Uh, monks come here sometimes and make sun mandalas. Yes. So you both, yeah. <clears throat> so they have this practice in, in the, like when, when an initiation is being given, if there are monks available to make a mandala, then they do that. They use this colored sand, and it's quite an ama amazing process if you watch them do it with these little tubes and <laughs> incredible patience. And they must get as well. But anyway, um, they make these beautiful mandalas. If, and if they don't have time to make a sand mandala, you can also have a painted mandala, like a tanka. You may have seen those as well, paintings of mandalas. And um, but so anyway, this this is usually it's um, like flat or two dimensional. But when you're doing tantra practice, you visualize it 3D. So it's like fully <laughs> around you, above you, and around you, and all around. And all the different aspects of the mandala, the different um, parts of the mandala, represent different aspects of the path. And there's often different deities within the mandala. Some of you may have done the Nyungne practice, which is related to um, Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, Thousand Arm Chenrezig. So in that practice, it's a relatively simple mandala. 
um, Chenrezig in the center of this beautiful mansion, and there's the four or there's five Dhyani Buddhas. One is on top of his head, and the other four are around. I'm going to talk about those later if I have time. Um, but anyway, it's 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 another aid to remembering the aspects of what we are trying to do in our practice, the six perfections, bodhicitta, emptiness, and so on. So you do you do you visualize the mandala when you're doing your tantric sadhana, but also even when you're out, you're going about your daily activities, driving around Santa Fe, <laughs> you also imagine the whole environment around you is is the mandala. Um, and then the second is complete purity of body. So that's like your body is the body of the deity made of light, very beautiful and pure. And all of these things also um, are seen as manifestations of wisdom, the wisdom realizing emptiness imbued with bodhicitta, imbued with love and compassion. So that's always there in your mind. The whole purpose of doing all this is to help sentient beings, to reach enlightenment and help sentient beings. And so that's your reason, your motivation, and you also have this awareness of emptiness, that everything is empty of inherent independent existence. So again, ideally, you've already been meditating on those things and you have them quite strong in your mind. So it's that mind of emptiness, wisdom of emptiness, that is what manifests as or appears as the deity and um, the mandala. Then number three, complete purity of resources. So this refers to the things that you use and enjoy, like food and drinks and clothes and your house or your belongings. So you see all of those things as pure as well. Their nature is blissful wisdom. Um, that's why when we uh, offer food, when we you know eat together, or even when we're eating on our own, before starting to eat, we bless the food, imagine it as pure, divine, blissful nectar, and then offer it to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And if you're a tantric practitioner, you would see yourself as the deity, and you're offering it to the deity. And when uh, using, like eating food or using anything else, um, ideally you do it without attachment, our normal, you know, attachment, self-centered <laughs> attachment, greed, wanting more, wanting more. Um, instead of that, um, we, uh, we think we're using it for the benefit of sentient beings, you know, for our practice, our benefit of enlightenment, the benefit of all sentient beings. There's some static noise. Um, and, and also using all of these things, eating food and so on, if you do it correctly with, with, with the right method, then it, in, it can increase your wisdom. Your wisdom increases, which is the antidote to delusions, attachment, and so on. And then the fourth is the complete purity of activities. So this means that you, again, you're imagining yourself as a Buddha, an enlightened being in the form of this deity. So what does an enlightened being do? <laughs> How do they spend their time? <laughs> <laughs> they help sentient beings. <laughs> um, so that's the ideal. And we're training you know, to attain that in the future. And so within the sadhana that you do in your, in your meditation cushion, there's, um, you know, after arising as the deity, then there's um, places in the sadhana where you imagine sending out light from your body like we did earlier in the meditation. Imagine light going out to sentient beings and benefiting them. You can do it in a quick way, like just zapping them and they all become Buddhas. <laughs> or it's probably more skillful to do it, if you have time, to do it gradually. Like, because um, <clears throat> this is actually something you can do while you're reciting a mantra. 
sometimes you spend a lot of time reciting a mantra if you have a commitment to recite tens of thousands of mantras or whatever. But you have a lot of time. So while reciting the mantra, you can be doing this sort of visualization. So, for example, you send light to the hells and you imagine it transforms into rain that quen that um, douses the fires of the hell and 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 um, heals their bodies, all their wounds and their burns and so on. And then you imagine purifying their karma so they can get out of hell into a better situation, get human rebirths, meet teachers and so on. So you can really get very elaborate, go all the, go all the details of how you, how you can help sentient beings. <laughs> and it's really powerful. It really helps um, increase your compassion and your love. Anyway, so that's the four purities and again i'll read something from alex um about these he says one of the most characteristic features of tantra is what we call deity yoga where we imagine ourselves to be a buddha figure and he says he prefers to use the word imagine rather than visualize um, because it's not just about having a visual picture but we actually imagine we are a Buddha in that figure, and we're doing all these activities. So you might find that word more helpful, imagine. I think everybody probably fantasizes sometimes. Is there anybody here who has fantasies? Anybody who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of normal, even little kids, you know, they create fantasies. And then as we get older, we also have fantasies. And often, I, probably most of our fantasies are, you know, about me, egocentric and involve attachment, desire or anger. When we're angry at somebody, we can fantasize getting back at them, <laughs> doing nasty things to them. <laughs> So I think it's kind of normal um, human mind <laughs> to do that, to have fantasies. Um, so we have that ability. We do have the ability to fantasize or imagine, and we can, they can be very elaborate. And I've heard, I don't, you know, I haven't studied much science, but I've heard um, with neuroscientists, when they study the brain, they say that, when you imagine doing something, it has the same effect on the brain as if you're actually doing it. Have you heard yeah. that? You imagine playing the piano and it, your brain <laughs> reacts the same way as if you're actually playing the piano, something like that. So that shows that it, imagination can be very, very powerful. So this Tantra is tapping into that ability of imagination and using it in a beneficial way, using it to create the causes for enlightenment and benefiting sentient beings. Um, yeah, so anyway, imagination. So then he goes on to say, not only do we imagine looking like this figure, but we also imagine speaking, thinking, helping others and experiencing pure enjoyment with all our senses, like a, uh, a Buddha does. We also imagine having all its good qualities, such as equal love and compassion for all beings, and deep understanding of everything, wisdom, understanding everything. Of course, to do this successfully, we need to have trained beforehand in each of these qualities with sutra practice, so if we haven't actually worked on cultivating loving and loving kindness and compassion, just imagining we have loving and kindness and compassion may not be very effective. So we do have to go through the other practices to actually cultivate those. <clears throat> um, putting them all together, meaning you know all the practices and qualities we've developed in sutra, putting them all together with deity yoga then is like a dress rehearsal for actually being a Buddha. By rehearsing now, we build up powerful causes for attaining enlightenment. This extremely efficient method is known as practicing causes that are the most similar to the result, or as it's normally called, bringing the result into the path. 
practicing now as if we already have reached the result. This is not easy to do. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not good at doing it. When I'm sitting on my seat and doing the meditation, I can kind of get a sense of this, but as soon as I get up and go and do other things, I forget it. So I think you really have to be, um, you know, quite a advanced practitioner. But, you know, you hear about people who go into retreat, like in Tibet, this was quite common. They go into retreat and they just stay in retreat full time, even all, you know, till they die. Sometimes they even make that commitment. I will stay here until I die. And um, so if you're in that situation where you're just practicing full time and you don't have other things taking your time and energy away and distractions and so on, then you can imagine that it is doable. And um, yeah. But I think I'm a few lifetimes away from that. <laughs> but at least, you know, even if you're not, one isn't able to do it now, to practice in that way now, just starting to make connection with Tantra, starting to, you know, take the first little baby steps in it, at least we're creating the causes to meet it again in the future, to meet these teachings and practices in the future and be able to do them in a, in a better way in our future lives. And I do sometimes see or hear about people like Western people who come from our background and they get involved in Buddhism and just really quickly they're able to go into it. Like Tenzin Palma, for example, she's quite extraordinary. I don't know if you've met her or heard of her, but English girl, <laughs> but she said when she was a teenager, she heard about Buddhism and she just knew I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and she started, you know, even before even meeting teachers and so on, um, acting like a Buddhist. So that's probably strong imprints from past lives. And then she went to India. She was still really young in her early 20s, met her teacher and immediately felt this is my teacher. And her teacher recognized her. From, uh, you know, from a previous life. They'd been had a teacher-disciple connection in a previous life. But within a relatively short time, she was up in a cave in the mountains. 12 years. She spent 12 years in a cave alone. I mean, really, really extraordinary. So I think, you know, having practiced in past lives, having learned the teachings, practiced the teachings, started creating the causes, then in, in a future life, that that may be possible. We just keep going, life after life, building up our practice, our abilities. Any questions so far? I just keep going, but maybe you would like to ask a question about something that's not clear. Uh, thank you, Venerable. I've, I've heard it said when people are taking um, tantric initiations, they say they're there just for the blessing. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe explain that, that that way of speaking a little bit? You don't mind? Yeah, I do have. I'm going to be talking about initiations later, um, but it. I, my understanding is um, the the person giving the initiation, the master, the yeah, master giving the initiation. Um, needs to say that that's okay. So often His Holiness, especially when he's giving Kali Chakra initiation, which is usually draws a huge number of people, and um, it's like a really high level initiation. But he says that people can can attend the initiation and not actually take it in the sense of fully taking on all the commitments and so on, but just to sit there and um, take it like a blessing. And so, um, so if the teacher says that, then then I think that's okay. But if the teacher doesn't say that, if the teacher doesn't make that, um, what's the word, allowance or spec? I don't know. Anyway, if the teacher doesn't say it's okay to do that, I don't think it's right for people attending to just assume that they can do that. That's my understanding. Um, so if you're in doubt, it's probably best to check, ask the teacher. 
I'm trying to remember other situations where I've been. It's actually kind of unusual. It's not the normal thing, but some teachers do allow that. And I think especially with Kali Chakra, which I don't fully understand, but it's, you know, it's considered a very beneficial thing for people to make that connection for things that will happen in the future. Yeah, but later I'll go through the different kinds of initiations and talk more about what it means to take an initiation, how to take it, and, and so on. Anyone else online? Okay, I'll leave time later um, for questions that may come up. So the next slide is about the four classes of Tantra. So these are four levels of Tantra. And again, they're all traced to the Buddha. And they were all taught by the Buddha. And um, they are meant for different kinds of practitioners, different levels of ability. And um, so, yeah, there's a few reasons for differentiating these four. Um, one difference is according to the level of desire that a person, a practitioner, is able to take into the path without succumbing to it. So that's written on there. So I did mention this yesterday. One of the unique features of Tantra is that it has practices for using delusions in the path. Instead of seeing the delusion as something, oh, I have to get rid of, and kind of rejecting it, um, there are practices for utilizing delusions and helping you progress along the path. And one of my teachers said, this is actually talking about subtle delusions and not the really gross, coarse delusions that most people have and driving their lives and so on. Um, so to be able to do this kind of practice, a person needs to have already done a lot of other practices, more basic practices, um, renunciation, bodhicitta, understanding of emptiness, and have their minds pretty much under control, like a really gross level of delusions. You're able to manage those rather than being overwhelmed by them. Nevertheless, it takes a long time to be free of delusion. Then we do have to, in order to become a Buddha, to become enlightened, we do have to rid our mind of delusions, ignorance, greed, hatred. It's not that you take your delusions with you to enlightenment. <laughs> That's impossible. You can't be enlightened and have delusions. So they are totally contradictory to enlightenment. So they do have to be eliminated, um, but it, it's not easy to eliminate them. Um, even if you have the direct realization of emptiness, which is the actual antidote, the remedy to delusions, that's the thing that completely eliminates delusions, but it, they don't all go at once. They go gradually. You kind of shave off layers of them, like peeling away the layers of an onion. So you, you need, on the sutra path, that's why you need such a long time. You need to understand emptiness, gain a direct realization of emptiness, and then keep meditating on emptiness again and again and again so that you can gradually eliminate the different layers or levels of delusions. And you need method, the method side of the path, uh, creating virtue, benefiting sentient beings, practicing giving, and so on and so forth, to empower the mind, to give the mind energy to be able to do this, to be able to get rid of these layers of delusions. And that's why method and wisdom are both needed. So it's a gradual process. So even when you're on the tantric path, you know, you might be a really qualified, um, uh, proficient practitioner, but you probably still have delusions in your mind. <laughs> they haven't gone away. And so, um, so tantra has this, this, these practices for using delusions in the path. And it's mainly desire, mainly um, the energy of desire. I haven't heard 
explanations. And we tried to ask our teacher this, but he he couldn't give an answer either. So it's mainly desire. And um, so mm, desire is something we all have. And um, what normally happens uh, when we perceive an object, it could be a person or another kind of living being, like a poodle, if you really love poodles and you see a poodle and you think, oh, I have to have that poodle. <laughs> so it could be a sentient being. It could be some material object, car, or new phone, or computer, or piece of furniture, or piece of clothing, food, and so on. So just about anything could be an object of desire. So the first thing that happens is we, we perceive that object and we perceive it as something attractive, you know? And this is individual, because what one person finds attractive, somebody else doesn't. But for, for because of our karma and whatever going on in our mind, we perceive that object as attractive. And if we're not mindful, if we're not careful, it quickly turns into desire. I want that. I have to have that. That will bring me happiness. That will bring me pleasure, fulfillment, whatever. You know, so there's this strong sense of an I over here who wants to be happy. And then seeing this object over there that we think will bring us happiness. So, so attachment is wanting the object. And in between, there's also the mind has this tendency to exaggerate and superimpose. So instead of seeing the object just as it is, we kind of add things. We add more layers. Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially when you fall in love with somebody. It's like, <gasps> <laughs> this person is a god or a goddess or whatever, you know. Prince Charming, Princess, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, the mind fantasizes, exaggerates, superimposes, builds up an image of the object to be much more wonderful than it really is. And of course that feeds the desire. Oh, I have to have it. <laughs> so that's what normally happens in human beings, but all sentient beings, they have desire too. Or animals have desire. They see things, a dog sees a bone. I have to have that. <laughs> and don't take it away from me. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Desire, or it's also called attachment, craving, grasping, clinging. There's different terms or different levels of it as well. This is one of the main things that keeps us stuck in samsara, in this cycle of death and rebirth, and doesn't enable us to get out of samsara and attain nirvana and enlightenment. So it's something we need to overcome if that's what we want. I mean, if you want to stay in samsara and enjoy samsara, Go right ahead. Have all the desire you want. <laughs> but if you see the disadvantages of samsara and you want to get out, then this is something we need to overcome, desire. Because otherwise it can motivate actions, karma, that um, bring suffering and bring rebirth in samsara. So it's, it's what lies behind a lot of our non-virtuous or unwholesome actions. Also, another thing that happens if you've had teachings on the 12 links, um, this is the process whereby we die and take rebirth and keep going around and around in samsara. Um, so just before death of one life, what happens is usually craving and grasping two of the links, link eight, link nine, come up in our mind. We feel, we feel this life is ending and we're scared and we don't want to, you know, go out of existence. So this strong craving and grasping for another life, another body comes up. And that those factors activate one of our karmic seeds for rebirth so that it comes up, activated, and that throws us into the next life. So it's one of the main factors responsible for us continuously taking rebirth in samsara. So like when the Buddha gave his first teaching on the Four Noble Truths, and he explained suffering and then the causes of suffering, what he said as the 
cause of suffering. He mentioned craving. Cause of suffering is craving. I mean, that's only one. There's other causes as well. But the fact that he mentioned craving, which is a type of desire, a type of attachment, shows how important it is or how crucial it is in our in our situation in samsara. Um, <clears throat> so somebody following Tantra, of course, is aiming for enlightenment and knows they have to overcome desire eventually. But it's possible to use desire in the path. So just, you know, to actually do this, you need teachings on Tantra, but just roughly to explain what, <coughs> how it's done. Um, so when a tantric practitioner experiences desire, and it's really talking about the kind of desire that arises for another person, sexual desire, romantic desire. Yeah. So when we see another person that we find attractive, as I said, that kind of desire is the strongest of all, stronger than a desire for food and puppies and <laughs> <you> know, whatever. <laughs> desire for uniting with another person, getting close to another person. So for a tantric practitioner, when that kind of desire arises in the mind, what they do is they notice the desire and they don't let themselves follow it, which is what normally happens. And instead, they meditate on emptiness. So they've already got a really good understanding of emptiness. So they bring in their understanding of emptiness and that will stop the mind from just getting caught up in and overwhelmed by the desire. And when desire arises, there's also a blissful feeling. It's a kind of really nice, pleasant, blissful feeling. And this blissful feeling, this blissful state of mind, um, is a more subtle state of mind. So the practitioner will use that subtle, blissful mind, again, to meditate on emptiness, and this produces a very special realization of emptiness, kind of makes the, makes the realization of emptiness more powerful and more able to eliminate uh, the delusions like desire. So don't ask me how this is done. I, have, I don't have experience of it, but this is how it's described. And... Um, so desire arises along with some blissful feeling. The practitioner immediately remembers emptiness, meditates on emptiness. And that mind, which is more subtle and also more blissful, is a very powerful mind to use to meditate on emptiness and realize emptiness. So your, em your understanding of emptiness gets stronger. And then that stronger understanding of emptiness is able to eliminate the desire, to overcome the desire so they use this analogy in the in the traditional teachings. They say it's like there's certain types of insects, probably termites and so on, that are born in wood. And then once they're born, they eat the wood. <laughs> they destroy the wood. So in a similar way, um, a, a tantric practitioner um, uses desire like, um, let me see how it says. Yeah. So a blissful mind that realizes emptiness, which arose initially from desire. You know, so it started off with desire, but then it transforms into this blissful mind realizing emptiness. And then that mind eats the desire, <laughs> destroys the desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I think it's, not easy, and I think you do have to be quite an advanced practitioner to be able to do this. But that's the general meaning of using desire in the path or taking desire in the path. So it's really for the purpose of overcoming desire and not increasing desire. That needs to be understood. And so these four different um, classes um, or levels of Tantra, one of the ways they are differentiated is by way of the level of desire a practitioner is able to use in this sort of practice without being overwhelmed by it. Because if, you know, if you're not really well developed, maybe you, you try to do this practice, but you know, instead you just get taken over by desire. You succumb to desire and then it, you lose it. 
So the first of the four classes is called Action Tantra, Kriya Tantra in um, uh, Sanskrit. Kriya means action. And so a person who does this practice, this level of Tantra practice, is able to use the desire that can arise just by looking at an attractive person. Okay, so looking at, and, and this doesn't mean that the person is going around looking at attractive people, but rather within their, um, the sadhana and visualization of themselves as a deity, um, there's maybe parts of the practice where you have offering goddesses, beautiful offering goddesses coming out from your heart and making offerings and so on. Or you have another deity within the mandala that you're meditating on. So it's more a meditated, a meditative uh, figure rather than a real person. That's my understanding of it. So just by looking at or imagining an attractive uh, figure of another person, the desire that arises from that this person is able to use that level of desire. It's a relatively low level of desire. So they, they're able to use that in, in this practice. Um, the second class of Tantra is called Performance Tantra, Charya Tantra in Sanskrit. And a person who's suitable for this, pra this level of Tantra is able to use the desire that arises from exchanging glances smiling and laughing so like in real life you know if you're just looking at someone that's one thing but if the other person looks at you <laughs> you what's that expression um i forget when you look at each other you exchange glances make eye contact that's what i was thinking so you actually have eye contact with the other person they're looking at you and maybe also looking interested and and smiling at each other and maybe you know <laughs> starting to talk make some conversation so then that leads to a stronger level of desire so a practitioner of this level is able to use that level of desire in the path and then the third class is yoga tantra and a person on this level is able to use um, the desire that arises from actually making bodily contact, starting to touch, hold hands. So again, that's a stronger level of desire that's coming up. And the fourth class is called Highest Yoga Tantra, Maha Anuttara Yoga Tantra. And a person who's um, a suitable practitioner of this level of Tantra is able to use the desire that comes from actual sexual union, which is a super powerful <laughs> level of desire. But yeah, they're able to not succumb to the desire, but be aware of it, mindful of it, remember emptiness and use that in their practice for enhancing the experience of emptiness. And on this level, of the, the fourth um, level of Tantra, Highest Yoga Tantra, um, there's a lot of practices that utilize um, bodily energies. We have these subtle energies or airs within our body. And um, so there's practices using breathing, for example, certain types of pranayama, breath, breath, um, meditation, and then working with these subtle energies in the body and also more subtle levels of mind. This is the level of Tantra where they have the explanation of the, the gross mind and the subtle mind and the very subtle mind of clear light. So that's the real aim in, in the practice is to access this most subtle level mind of, uh, level of mind of clear light, the clear light mind and then utilize that in your practice to meditate on emptiness, to use that mind to realize emptiness. And that becomes the most powerful mind <laughs> that exists and is able to eliminate the obscurations like the delusions and also the more subtle obscurations that prevent enlightenment. So those can be eliminated very quickly 
in by doing this kind of practice. Normally, on the sutra path, it takes eons to be able to eliminate those um, obscurations. But in tantra, they can be eliminated very, very quickly. But it's not easy to do. You have to go through a lot of different practices, really train your mind, and super strong concentration, really good understanding of emptiness, really strong commitment to bodhicitta and helping sentient beings. So you have to do a lot of preparatory work to get to the point where you're able to do that. <clears throat> so again, Tantra is said to be a quicker path to enlightenment, but that doesn't mean easier. Probably more, I don't know, more difficult. <laughs> And then another way of distinguishing the four um, classes of Tantra is with regard to the kind of activities that are emphasized. So Kriya, in Kriya Tantra, the first level called Action Tantra, the emphasis is more on external actions, external rituals. So for example, um, Cleanliness is very important. If, if you do the Nyungne practice, you know, you have to wash a lot and brush your teeth a lot. And you have to avoid um, certain types of foods that are considered impure foods like, you know, non-vegetarian foods and eggs and so on. So certain types of foods should be avoided. So cleanliness, external cleanliness and, and and diet are emphasized very much in Kriya Tantra. And there's a lot of ritual, a lot of mudras you need to do. Um, so more emphasis on external things. And then Charya, the second one, performance Tantra, um, has equal emphasis on external actions and internal actions. Internal actions means what you're doing with your mind. So with Kriya, uh, sorry, with Charya Tantra, you're moving more in the direction of what's going on in your mind. And then the third one, Yoga Tantra, there's still some emphasis on external actions, but more on internal actions, what you're doing internally with your mind. And then with Highest Yoga Tantra, the last one, the emphasis is mainly internal actions. So there's not so much concern about your diet and cleanliness. You can be... And dirty and <laughs> I mean up in the in the caves in Tibet I don't know if they had much access to they certainly didn't have hot showers and soap and things like that so probably externally they weren't too clean and they would eat just whatever they could get so there's less emphasis on external things and more emphasis on your mind your mental activities and mental states and so on and in particular, the emphasis is on getting in touch with this uh, clear light mind, the most subtle level of mind, um, activating that and utilizing that. And then working with the, in, the energy winds, the channels. We also have chakras and channels in our body. So in highest yoga time, I mean, there's just a certain amount of that in the other classes of Tantra as well working with the winds and the channels and the chakras. But it, the highest yoga tantra has the most developed um, aspects of practice working with those. So my experience is in the Tibetan tradition, most of the initiations and practices are either from the first class, action tantra, kriya tantra, or the fourth one, highest yoga tantra. Um, I have never attended any initiation in the second and the third. They might exist, but they're just not practiced much. Um, in, I mentioned yesterday in Japan, um, they have tantra in the one Japanese tradition called Shingon. And I think it's the third class of Tantra, Yoga Tantra, that they that they practice. Um, Mahavirachana is their main practice, the main deity that they practice. I just read a little bit about it. I haven't learned much, but so like the Nyungne 
practice, which is related to Chen Rezik, Thousand Arm Chen Rezik, that is from the first class of Tantra, Kriya Tantra. And again, that's why you have to be so clean and watch your diet and, and so on. <clears throat> um, yeah, so after lunch, when we come back, I'll talk about initiations, <laughs> different kinds of initiations, qualifications for yourself as a person taking initiations and also the teacher giving the initiation. And then, yeah, we'll see what how much time we have to look at a few other things. So we'll stop there for this morning. And let's make a mental dedication of the merit, positive energy, sitting and listening with the positive motivation, the bodhicitta motivation, the wish to develop our potential for enlightenment so we can benefit all sentient beings and be as beneficial to them as much as we can while we're on the way to enlightenment. We don't have to wait till we're a Buddha to start helping others. We should start helping others as much as we can now. So having that motivation for being here and listening and learning. So we definitely created merit, positive energy. And now let's share that with others, all living beings. May it be a cause for all of them to be free of their suffering and the causes of suffering, which are mainly delusions, ignorance, greed, hatred, and so on, and negative karma. May they be free from those and may they have happiness and its causes, which is mainly positive states of mind, virtuous states of mind, like love and compassion and virtuous actions, helping rather than harming, living ethically rather than recklessly. So may all beings be free of suffering and its causes, have happiness and its causes, and as quickly as possible reach the highest level of happiness, enlightenment. Okay, thank you. See you later.